All right. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the North Northeast Oversight Committee meeting. I'm glad you're here. I'm Dr. Stephen Holt, and I have the opportunity to chair this wonderful committee. So welcome to tonight's uh, engagement and involvement. If you have not signed in, please do so. And then it would be great for you to grab the packet that is back on the sign-in table. We want your information so that we can stay in communication with you. We give updates as to what's going on. We like to um, stay accountable as the oversight committee and stay uh, communicative uh, as developments happen. So there are a couple things tonight um, <clears throat> that are important for me to kind of begin with. Um, if this is your first oversight committee meeting, I'm super excited about your being here. If this is uh, one of many, then you know kind of our approach and the way we do what we do. Um, this is a open meeting to the community, but it is not a community meeting. And what that means is, is you are a part of getting a chance to watch the process of the oversight committee as it relates to engaging with partners that are on the agenda. And so we will be talking about the items on the agenda. If you would like to testify, if you have a thought, concern, or question related to something on the agenda, then you can sign up in order to do so. And there will be opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting. Now, if there are concerns, if there are items, if there are issues that you want to address that you have in mind related to affordable housing or related to the work of the Oversight Committee, then you can talk to one of the uh, staffers for the Portland Housing Bureau. You can grab one of the uh, committee members after the committee, uh, after the meeting is over. So again, the dialogue tonight is in regard to the items that are on the agenda. Uh, and the testimony at the end will give opportunity for um, discussion around the items that are on the agenda. The other thing about this particular meeting and my style of uh, running a meeting is to do my best to keep us on target. I value people's time and appreciate uh, your being here. So we're gonna do what we can to make sure that we're getting the information and we're being thorough in um, examining the information, but we're also going to do our best to stay very time sensitive. So uh, with those items being stated, uh, I guess I should also give you a housekeeping uh, item that is for the restrooms. Uh, they're right back here, right past the tables uh, to your left. Okay, a couple things then, a couple of other items I have, a couple talking points I want to uh, introduce. We have... Um, a new member to our oversight committee. We had a new one in our last meeting, and now we have another addition to our oversight committee, and that is Dr. Karen Edwards, um, who works with PCC, and I'd like to welcome you to the oversight committee. Thank you. And give you an opportunity just to say a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you very much. I'm certainly happy to serve. I'm committed to North Northeast Portland for sure. I'm the president of the Cascade Campus of Portland Community College. Uh, this is my fourth year uh, being here in Portland and, and again, just honored to serve the community. Thank you. Thank you. We're super excited about your being here. And then also in a new capacity, uh, has been with, uh, uh, and at several of these meetings in a different capacity, but now as uh, an official representative of the mayor's office, Cupid Alexander is here, and he is now the, the new representative from the mayor's office. I don't know if you want to say anything, Mr. Alexander. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. All right. In our next oversight committee meeting, uh, which will happen on the second Thursday in November, Mayor Wheeler will be with us. So you're more than welcome to come and kind of get a view of the things he's concerned about as it relates to affordable housing, as it relates to preference policies, as it relates to the work that is going on. So I want you to know about that in advance. Um, Two other items. One is for any of the partners or any of the individuals who are here in the uh, audience, if there is a desire, concern, or, um, or I, I guess I'd say desire to be on the agenda, then you will need to reach out to 
Leslie Goodlow at Portland Housing Bureau. She is the staffer of the, she is the individual who staffs the oversight committee for the Portland Housing Bureau. So if you correspond with her, then she can get the information out in order to be on the agenda. And lastly, and most significantly of everything I've announced, for every group, this is for partners and or city and or any individuals who will be presenting at meetings like this. It is central, paramount, essential that we have the materials that are being talked about at least seven days in advance in order for us to do the job that we are challenged, charged to do. Our responsibility as the oversight committee is to work in behalf of the communities that we represent and the community at large. And in order to do that, especially around these vital items and vital issues that are being discussed, we need to have the material in advance to review so that our questions, so that our interaction, so that our responses can be thought through and intelligible, especially if there are things we need to make decisions in regard to. So, in light of that, Provided we do not, going forward, have the information at least seven days in advance, then we'll be scratching individuals from the meeting or the agenda of the night. It's not fair to the community and or the oversight committee to get the information the day of or you know, within that time frame and not have the appropriate opportunity to examine the material. We want to do our job most effectively. We want you to be able to present the information in a most effective manner so that the conversations and the engagement are productive for all parties. Does that make sense to everybody? Excellent. Well, again, welcome. I'm glad you're here, and we look forward to our time. Let me just simply, again, reiterate that our discussions tonight, if you would like to talk, if there's testimony and thought, regard to the agenda items and those only uh, when it comes time to what we're calling public testimony. Those are also limited in scope and duration. So with all of that being said, we are going to begin. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one more thing. Matthew Shabo. Uh, good evening. Uh, so one just quick update. So the Housing Bureau has been working with Cascadia Behavioral Health, and they're in the process of developing a multifamily building and they have asked uh, for our support in their voluntary use of the preference policy. And so they're getting to a place now where they're, they anticipate starting to collect applications mid to late October. Uh, there'll be 31 of the units that will utilize the preference policy, four studios, 24 one bedrooms and three two bedrooms. Again, they voluntarily approached us and asked for our help and guidance in, in using that policy and they wanted me to share that with you this evening, uh, given that they're starting to pull their materials together uh, to advertise these, and they've asked for our assistance, and I believe they'd like to come before you and speak with you about this as well. So just an FYI. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Legacy Property Project. Kimberly Branham, Executive Director of Prosper Portland, and I believe Tori Campbell. Thank you. And you will have the 30 minutes that we've Okay, so, great. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, talk with you. Uh, so we wanted to mainly have an opportunity to hear from you all um, about your recommendations on both the process moving forward around public engagement, as well as some of the priorities for this project. Um, and so that's really the goal. I'm going to give a bit of an overview just to ground us and make sure that everyone has um, the information about what is known and what is not yet known. Um, and then hopefully we can hear from you all about what is, what is important. So, um, uh, it, in addition to Tori and myself, I'd like to recognize um, Dr. Brown from Legacy Health, who is in the audience, as well as Vicki Gwynn. Both of them are part of this collaborative team, um, and so they're here to answer any questions that might come up. Um, and uh, we have, um, let's see, I'll go to the next cell block. So, so I think I'm sure that almost everybody in this room knows the um, 
the history of the Hill Block, uh, but it was once the real center of the African American community and the commercial corridor um, in particular. Um, and so the fact that it has not been developed on was brought up um, throughout, has been brought up um, on numerous occasions. And in particular, we heard about it when we were doing the community development initiative outreach, which Sheila um, helped us with. Um, and I know it also came up when the Housing Bureau was looking for input um, as part of the North Northeast Housing Oversight Committee. So this is something that um, we have been aware of was a community priority to see movement on. Um, and so when, um, after this committee presented to City Council in January or February of this year, one of the things that we heard from city council members was we really would like you, Prosper Portland, to engage with Legacy and see if there is something that we might be able to do together. And so that's the history and that's why we're here today because we've been able to have conversations with um, Dr. Brown and his team and the mayor's office um, and have come forward with um, what is a collaborative proposal from the city, Prosper Portland and Legacy Health. So the, the extent of the proposal is effectively that we um, agree to work together to redevelop the full 1.7 acre site, which is currently owned by Legacy Health, um, that we have an alignment of values in terms of ensuring that the benefits um, and the development supports and honors the um, African American community and um, is aligned with the mission of promoting health and wellness. Um, just want to be very clear, there's been some questions around this, so I want to be clear that Legacy Health has agreed to contribute the uh, property to the development and transfer ownership, and that it would pay for any portion of the development that had a, a medical use. Is it hard to hear, or is it okay? It's like a popping. Should, am, I, am I too close? Is that better? Um, the other thing that we have committed to is implementing a transparent and community-centered engagement process. Um, we propose to do so by having a project working group which would inform that process so that it's not just Legacy Health and Prosper Portland and the city which is defining the process but that we have community leaders who engage in the creation of the process. Um, we propose to have, in addition to community members, representatives from this body, from the North Northeast Community Development Initiative oversight, as well as a group that has been advising legacy in terms of their reconciliation process. Um, and the mayor and uh, Prosper Portland and Legacy would jointly review names that come forward. And so we're hoping to be able to engage with this group to understand if there's um, anyone or any, um, a couple people who'd like to participate on that group. Um, so the possible development program um, is changing a little bit with the comprehensive plan, um, which will go into effect in 2018. As part of the comprehensive plan, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability has done a significant assessment on looking at campuses. So campuses like PCC and Legacy Health and others would no longer be um, conditional uses or outside of um, a specific designation, but would have a designation as a campus use. So as part of that, that process, the um, zoning is um, going to change for this site. And what that means is that there will be significant flexibility on what can go onto this site. So residential, retail, um, effectively, it's almost anything that benefits the community and aligns with the medical, um, the, the spaces that are adjacent. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, you could build up to almost 25,000 square feet on the site. That's just what's allowable. Um, and we've put on this slide some of the uses that have been talked about either through the North Northeast Community Development Initiative process or the North Northeast Neighborhood Housing um, process. And so that those have certainly included affordable housing, workforce housing, community gathering spaces, a cultural business hub, community health center, retail spaces, and other community de desired amenities. I wanna be really clear that this is in no way um, the, the only things that could go on it, this, these are really um, examples of what we've heard and that could be, that would be allowed on the site. Um, this is an example through the Legacy Manual Community Partnership of the kinds of input that Legacy received um, when they were working with their group 
um, that's been focused on reconciliation since 2012. Um, and so some of the tenants and the focus, uh, I'm sorry, the advice that they received in that process is to make sure that any development of this land should inc uh, include a component of wealth creation um, and should build affordable housing as well as honor the history of the, um, the site and the community. So the North uh, Russell and Williams site is not currently within the interstate urban renewal area. It sits just outside the boundary. Um, and in order to, as you well know, receive uh, resources either through Prosper Portland or the Housing Bureau's um, TIF uh, tax increment finance resources, it would need to go in, into the interstate urban renewal area. Um, so we've been having conversations with the uh, community Development Initiative o Oversight Committee um, and would like to um, also hear your perspective on whether that is something that you would recommend. Um, if the urban renewal area is amended to include uh, this site, it does not automatically guarantee that it would receive resources, it just makes it available. Um, and so it would still need to go through the uh, relevant advisory bodies, whether the, those are the advisory bodies for Prosper Portland or the Housing um, Bureau in order to actually receive resources. So finally, our proposed next steps is that we um, have conversations about uh, whether and when to put it inside the interstate urban renewal area to put together a project working group and to really define a community process. Um, we've also committed to um, compiling and summarizing previous community input one of the things that we've heard is that there's been a lot of community conversation about this site for a very long time. People are tired of, of talking about it and they want to make sure that, um, or talking about it as if it hasn't been talked about before, and so they want to make sure that we do our work as staff to really summarize that and present that back, um, and then in the next few months to hold a broader community forum. So uh, I think we'll, we'll stop there for a, a moment or, or two and just take questions and comments, advice, any input that you have. Thank you, thank you very much. I will uh, ask the committee, committee questions. Thomas, Dr. Bethel. I just want to understand as I'm reading through this some of the things that they're promising. One thing that I noticed is that Legacy is going to give the property back. That's a good thing and to acknowledge that they took it, they really ought to give it back. But what is surprising to me is that they only want to pay for the medical portion when their promise of taking the land was to build affordable housing so that the employees who worked at Legacy would have a place to stay. Mm -hmm. This is probably not anything that's new for you both mm -hmm. to hear or others mm -hmm. to hear. So I'm wondering why won't Prosper Portland now push legacy mm -hmm. to contribute towards rebuilding the housing that mm -hmm. they took. Mm -hmm. I don't want to use the other word, but that they took and help replace and rebuild that which continues to make this hub mm -hmm. or the hill mm -hmm. property in terms of bringing community back together as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ought to get off as easy mm -hmm. as just mm -hmm. saying we'll donate the property back mm -hmm. and pay for our little corner over here. But what we promised to the community you go figure out a way to do that because we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking the government to help push mm -hmm. because the government was a part of the taking. Yeah. Thank you. So Dr. Bethel, um, I, I know that your, your sense of history on this is stronger than mine and so I, I will um, just posit that it was my understanding and maybe this is a misunderstanding, but it was my understanding that in the agreement that um, was crafted between the Emanuel Displaced Persons Association and PDC at the time and the Housing Authority and Legacy or Emanuel at the time um, was that that happened PDC would take on some of the responsibility for the affordable housing components to it. So um, I'd love to, to have more conversation but I, um, you know, I want to make sure that, that while we, um, you know, that, that PDC takes responsibility for our role in condemning um, and demolishing homes. Um, we did not, you know, legacy, this wasn't something that legacy did on its own and um, really the, the government acted. So um, I'd like to, to look at that a little bit because um, that was my understanding is that we were, PDC and the Housing Authority were responsible for delivering on the affordable housing components to it. So I, I wanna follow up on that. Um, 
Yes, I, I'd like to just follow up on that. I mean, I think that it's critical that we are very grounded in the, in the history. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Bethel, mm -hmm. Bishop Holt, Ms. Sheila, a lot of people mm -hmm. here have a very real knowledge of that history. Yeah. There's a huge archive of city yeah. documents right downtown, which would illuminate mm -hmm. the particulars. Um, but I would, I would take it further than just the promise made at that time, but also that there was an ongoing broken promise by, a, by the hospital entity over a period of decades. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there was, a, there was a division of labor at one point. Mm -hmm. That division of labor is important for us to know about, but it's not necessarily the one that needs to be continued mm -hmm. um, today when you have an entity that did not develop, did not bring the promised benefits, did not you know, create opportunities um, economically for for this specific community or for Portland at large. That I think there's an opportunity there to you know to push um, beyond just a corner of a site and and the development that will continue to benefit legacy into the future. So I'm really interested to get a little bit more down to the nitty gritty on some of these details. Mm -hmm. um, in particular. Um, you said there will be an ownership transfer. Who to whom mm -hmm. is ownership to be transferred, um, and is uh, Prosper Portland an interim mm -hmm. owner of mm -hmm. the site or a permanent mm -hmm. owner of the site? Mm -hmm. And I'm also interested to know whether, when you talk about community engagement, you are suggesting that there will be a process of people saying things that they want, or you are prepare to move into a binding and enforceable community benefits agreement that mm -hmm. has long-term monitoring mm -hmm. and accountability mm -hmm. across a wide variety of um, economic mm -hmm. benefits for people in the community. Yeah. Uh, so so for the, to the first question, um, we don't know, yet know to whom the property will be transferred. We aren't currently contemplating, although it's not um, impossible, but we aren't currently contemplating that Prosper Portland would be um, the entity to whom Legacy would um, grant the property. Um, we don't know yet whether uh, there's another community development entity that would receive that, but that's a very you know possible scenario. Um, and uh, so that's still to be determined. Um, it's something that the project working group, I think, will weigh in on. Um, and then in terms of the community um, engagement, you know, I, um, I think it's early to say what the mechanism will be. A community benefits agreement sounds very reasonable and it sounds realistic and, it, and it, I would anticipate that that would be a likely outcome. Um, but I also don't want to get in front of the project working group. Um, and so that would be one of the, the things, and the, you know, the mechanism for ensuring community benefits would be one of the things that the project working group would weigh into. Yeah, I mean, I would very strongly suggest that not only, not only Prosper Portland, but anyone who is going to be engaged in this project look very carefully at how community benefits agreements in their best practices have been structured in other cities in this country. Okay. Um, particularly, I would look at LA Alliance for New Economies, CBAs on both the Hollywood and Highland Mall development and the Staples Center. Okay. They have had a real and lasting impact, um, but they need to be structured in a way that involves legally enforceable mm -hmm. language between parties who agree that they will meet certain measurable goals and, and then move forward with them. And I would not think small mm -hmm. on what those benefits should be given, not only the historical importance of the site, but the fact that it's, it has sat vacant for decades um, after expropriation from its original owners. I just have one other follow-up question. Um, you said if TIF money is used, then the project will, um, you know, project resources would come mm -hmm. to the oversight committee. Is there any reason that TIF money would not be used? And if TIF money is not used, mm -hmm. then what will be the oversight body that would be serving in the function equivalent to this mm -hmm. group um, and the economic development working group for ICURA? Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm gonna just try to think of a scenario in which TIF weren't used. So let's say that we were to go through the project working group and it was determined that the best, most important use was an open space. Um, and that you know somebody was going to put in entire resources for a park. I, I think it's a very unlikely scenario, but 
you might not therefore need tax increment finance resources. Um, I think it's a likely um, option that tax increment finance resources would be needed in order to deliver on the kinds of community benefits, whether affordable housing or affordable commercial space. Um, and so um, in, in any of these cases, the project working group really will be steering the decision making, the governance structure. Um, and so, so those kinds of questions we, would be brought up at the project working group. But to the extent that it's an, using TIF, which I think is a very likely outcome, then those questions would come to this body and the um, North Northeast Community Development Initiative body. Does that answer your question? So you're saying only the portions of the development that involved TIF would come to these oversight committees. Everything else would just be addressed in the project working group? So I wanna differentiate between um, kind of decision making and influence and conversation. So at this point, I think the decision making in terms of, of um, affordable housing TIF would rest within this body, just as uh, for the um, use of if we were to consider putting a cultural business hub there that really is a decision that the North Northeast Community Development Initiative um, oversight body would make the project working group is uh, charged with moving the project forward um, but it's not as if we won't be coming to this body or either body to have conversations and to solicit input um, as community partners is the project working group a funding allocation committee no. Or a decision-making body. It is, an, well, we don't have a charter yet, but is, it is envisioned as a decision-making advisory body to move the project forward and establish priorities, processes, um, and yeah. And there's request, if I'm correct. Yes, there's requests. For persons from this yeah. uh, oversight committee to be a part of the project working group. Yeah. I have. Uh, yeah. So, it, thank you. So it's great to know that uh, Emmanuel and others have gotten together and come up with a way that uh, we can see some, and I won't say reciprocity, but some, some um, involvement in meeting the goals mm -hmm. or the commitments that were made early on. So. But my, my question is, we have a lot of uh, kitchens, well, mm -hmm. if not kitchens, at least cooks in mm -hmm. the kitchen with this from mm -hmm. the different combinations that you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I agree that there needs to be some way to ensure that we get real results out of this this time around. Mm -hmm. And so a, um, a community benefits agreement would be a great way to do that. Okay. And I think there was something like that that was established with Emmanuel in the community a few years ago that mm -hmm. was highly uh, recognized and it would be good to know how that um, actually is part of this process okay. along with what the, the Northeast, uh, North Northeast Initiatives mm -hmm. um, Committee came up with. Plus, on top of that, as you mentioned, there are all these things that have happened over the years. Um, there is the whole initial purpose and function of the URA itself. Mm -hmm. And I would not want to have, since this is a real opportunity now to fulfill some of the goals in the URA, mm -hmm. if we're going to come back and include them when the choice was made at the time that they didn't want to be in, mm -hmm. if they're coming back in at this state, that those goals around affordable housing, home ownership retention, uh, creating wealth, jobs, training, uh, wellness, a lot of those things were all included in the goals that were set forth in the Interstate Urban Renewal Advice um, yeah. or initially. Mm -hmm. So I hope that those things kind of be, again, become the framework within which the decisions are made going forward. Okay. And how do you ensure, isn't that the requirement of the URA that it has to adapt to what the goals are within the URA if it becomes yes. amended in? Yes. Yes, and, and um, 
And so I think as you mentioned, um, there were a number of, when we did, when we started looking before we did the community development initiative, as you um, recall, we did an assessment of what had been delivered from within the urban renewal area plan and what had not yet been delivered on. Um, and so certainly affordable, all of the things that you mentioned are squarely within those things that we still need to deliver on. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there's good cause to be able to explain why we would um, expand it to include this. Is that, report, is that publicly available? That yeah, that absolutely. So we've got about 10 more minutes. Huh? Where? Um, I don't know. Is it on our website? It might be. Well, we can follow we can up. Provide. I think it's in with, within the appendix of um, the, the report, but I'll look at it. About nine and a half. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Tori Campbell, and um, I manage our entrepreneurship and community economic, de community economic development uh, teams and initiatives and programs over at Prosper Portland. And I particularly work with um, basically your, your counterpart, your sister uh, oversight committee, which is the North Northeast Community uh, Development Initiative Oversight Committee. And I just want to take a few minutes to give an update on where they are in their processes. They're probably about a year and some change behind you. So there's that the initial uh, work of just the learning curve, trying to get acclimated to all the bureaucratic jargon and trying to make some common sense decisions um, and play a really an integral work, a role within the work of allocating the remaining $32 million towards economic opportunities uh, within the North Northeast area. For us, the goal is kind of the overarching umbrella has been any and everything we do looking forward, um, as a lot of the, the new initiative really does play out of from the initial framework of what the urban renewal area was designed for. Uh, but the intentionality is to recognize that it has not historically, over the last 15 years, benefited some of those initial audiences and members who made up this community. And so our intent moving forward over the next five years is to double down and be very clear on, uh, we're not creating something new. If, if anything, we're trying to make good on a promise uh, that has not fully been kept. And so the work that the uh, Oversight Committee has been charged with is to partner with us to figure out how to do that well, um, how to do that timely, and how to have good outcomes that we can measure and we can both celebrate and be held accountable for. And so I just want to take a few minutes to talk about where we are. Um, a little bit is just going to be the formation of the committee, some of the work they've done early. We've also provided some numbers that give you a sense early on as an early report card of where we are to date um, in this work. Um, so the initiative uh, was finalized and approved by the City Council in January and our oversight committee was established and had their first meeting in May. So that just gives you some time frame that really they've been functioning for the last six months. And in that time, uh, we've had at least four or five oversight committee meetings in this fashion. Uh, and we've also had a lot of subcommittee uh, meetings as well. As you know, a lot of times these meetings are really about being informed and making decisions, but the subcommittees where a lot of the real nitty gritty work takes place. And uh, to date, the group has done a number of things that I want to acknowledge um, in terms of the work that they've already figured out how to play uh, an important role in. Uh, some of the things that they have been charged to do is to help with our community livability grants, which is an annual uh, program that Prosper Portland does where we provide grants to nonprofit organizations uh, to help them with improvements on their uh, facilities that add value um, to uh, the community. And they've They've been able to, last year, uh, receive all of those community livability grant applicants. They reviewed them and made their decisions, and we were able to award eight uh, organizations within the Northeast area um, with uh, $300,000 worth of funding. And that'll, that's the cap every year is roughly around $300,000 that will be given over the next five years. Um, and we supported everything from uh, an organization that works with small businesses and helping to develop them, give them, get them strength and stability, uh, which is MISO, Microenterprise Services of Oregon. We were able to support in that community livability grant uh, Vancouver Avenue Baptist Church uh, towards their efforts of developing, I believe, a, a museum. Um, to archive the history of the African-American experience here in the city. So this just gives you kind of a, a, a breadth of where those grant dollars have gone and that oversight committee, that was one of their first charges to get into and to begin to sort through and make some decisions on. Um, also, the group has worked in the subcommittee area of choosing, which this is a part of their early work and mandate, was to choose 
uh, what we're calling a navigator for the North Northeast area. And that's just another person or organization that is boots on the ground to ensure that businesses in particular are learning about the programs that we have, the dollars that are being allocated to help support them and to grow them. And so that person, uh, we, that the subcommittee worked to choose that organization. And so now we're beginning to move forward on basically just having another entity in the community uh, to do that work along with Prosper Portland, um, which we felt like was incredibly important. Because as you know, a lot of times these programs happen and money's quote unquote given and out and available, but most folks that we want to see benefit from it have no clue about it. And so it's really our intent to try to figure out how do we do that. So you need more people power, um, and the group is helping us with that. We've also met around uh, the conversation that we're having tonight with you, which is the urban renewal area expansion. So it is in our preview to have that conversation, and that com and the committee is doing so, saying, uh, is, it, is it worth it? What does it mean to amend the Hill Block property into the urban renewal area? Uh, what is the impact of that? What role should we play? And obviously housing, you guys have been able to be at the table to talk around what it would mean for you if that property was to be enfolded into the urban renewal area. So that subcommittee met uh, this Tuesday as their first official meeting, and we will continue to meet subsequently over the next few weeks and months to try to uh, come to a decision. Um, and uh, as you know, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, like my grandpa said, I think the spirit of this is they're trying to take their time but make it quick, you know, just to make sure that they get it right in terms of what their role and responsibility is, recognizing that the property, both historically uh, the, the, and also the present impact, um, expands beyond not just us as an oversight committee. Um, and then lastly, I won't bore you with this, but I think the things we want to celebrate early on within the first six months, uh, we provided you with some information on just where dollars that have been spent thus far have gone. We realize this is very early on, meaning we've not really done uh, a major communication uh, strategy in terms of our normal points of uh, sharing our work. Uh, that's one of the subcommittee's uh, points of effort over the next uh, few months is actually come up with a strategy on how to make sure this message is getting to the appropriate audiences. But what we're currently using, um, some of the investment, we've already seen 29% of the, it's roughly about a little over a million dollars has already gone out the door and we feel like it's hitting our targets. So 29% has I expressed has come through the community livability grants, $300,000 there. 30% uh, of the funds that have already gone out in terms of investment have gone to property investment in terms of matching grants for business owners, and that's one of our signature programs. Um, and we found that even within there, that's been a good blend of African, African immigrant, Asian, and Latino-owned businesses that have benefited. Matter of fact, the only uh, two, two that we have denied funding for this particular program we're not folks of color. So like, you know, I want to say that because I think it's important to understand that we are trying to be very thoughtful and intentional, making sure where these dollars go. Um, within the plan, we do say, and it is allowed, that if a person is a long-term property owner, they can't have access uh, to these programs. So that could uh, oftentimes mean someone that is a, a white property owner. Um, but by and large, those who've responded to date have been uh, the, the target audience that we've been trying to make sure uh, accesses these programs moving forward. 31% um, has also gone into a matching grant in terms of property owners, which is helping them with developing their properties. And I think those two things are important, small business and property ownership. As we realize wealth creation, the real thrust of an ability to, to, uh, to amass wealth has everything to do with ownership. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is ensure that folks of color who've had property longstanding now have an opportunity to make good on that, and particularly in the way the market is. Um, there's more that I can share but I realize my time is at an end, and I want to create a space if there is an opportunity, if I can, doctor, if there's any questions, we'd be glad to answer them in a brief moment we have. Got about a minute. Any questions from the Oversight Committee? So um, I do have two suggestions. I think that it would be beneficial for the um, North, Northeast CDI and our Oversight Committee uh, to meet and to dialogue. I think that would be beneficial. And then um, it would be helpful if we could secure from the Portland Housing Bureau status of committed funds and uncommitted funds in the urban renewal area to help inform discussion around uh, committing funds to the Hill Block property. So it would be good for us to have that. Thank you very much for your presentation. You. We appreciate it. Thanks for being here tonight. The possibilities are awesome. Next on our agenda 
is Magnolia 2. Welcome. I'll have you introduce yourselves. And uh, we have a much larger team than two, so I guess we'll start and then we'll rotate chairs. through. Yeah, if you, yeah, well, we can bring we other chairs up or in the front row, and we could take turns. Just we'll know okay. who's next, and we'll go two at a time. But but as far as introductions, I'd kind of like everybody to be able to introduce themselves. Yeah, I'm Sarah Stevenson. I am the executive director at Innovative Housing. Thank you very much for making time for us tonight. I'm Julie Garver. I'm the housing development director at Innovative Housing. And then the rest of our team is kind of lined up in the front row. Do you just want to stand up and introduce yourselves and then they'll know you're, com you're going to be coming. Yeah, oh, that's great. I'm Julio Rocha with LRS Architects. Patricia Nixon, LRS Architects. Matt Dreska, LRS Architects. Sean Ball, LRS Architects. Nate McCoy, Executive Director, Nate Mac Morgan. Tony Jones, Executive Director of Metropolitan Contractor Improvement Partnership. Wilson Weston, Diversity Outreach Coordinator for Bremen Construction. And Pat Daniels, Executive Director for Construction Co. Pre-Apprenticeship Training Program. Wonderful. Right. And I'll let you do the same when you get your opportunity to mic, but it is on you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It is a, a large and great team. So are you, you will start, and then the architects will take my spot, and then I'll come back. So our uh, project at Magnolia 2 is a continuation of our Magnolia 1 project that is located at MLK and Cook. So this project will be on MLK and Fargo. And it includes 50 residential units, the phase two project, uh, 33 of which are two and three bedroom. We have a lot of family amenities. It's, it's really focused as a, as a family project and the resident services are tailored to families. And the architects are going to come up and talk with you a little bit about design. Hi, I'm Julio Rocha. So um, for our project here, um, for, we are uh, phase two of Magnolia One, as was mentioned already. And one of the exciting things about this project is we're going to connect to, the, to um, Magnolia One and share the amenity spaces with that. Some of the amenity spaces in Magnolia One are the community area, and there are two uh, exterior uh, amenity areas, one on level two, uh, which is nice and quiet, and one on the northeast corner of level five. So our residents will be able to um, share those amenities. Our project, I don't have a pointer here, as you can see is the colored area along MLK, um, connecting to the building, uh, we're going to have um, some program elements, uh, including the maker space, an indoor outdoor player area, meaning an indoor area for the children that will have an outdoor component that connects to the corridor uh, where our shared laundry is, and our resident services area. And there's also going to be bathroom and drinking fountain for those areas. Later on, someone will speak in more detail about the program of some of these elements. Our new entry is going to be off of Fargo on the south. You can see there. Um, we intend on uh, accentuating the entry, meeting all community design standard guidelines at the southwest corner of the site. We'll have our main lobby there near, near the elevator and um, our mailboxes and whatnot. We have ground level units which will be accessed from the interior corridor. Um, and we also have some ground level units facing the parking area. Our parking lot, rather than having another curb cut, we will be connecting to Magnolia One's parking area that you can see is accessed there on the north. This will provide nine additional parking stalls for the combined two projects. Um, let me get the slide here. So now, as you can see on the left slide, a little bit larger, um, we, uh, we have our main entry, we'll provide our long-term, I'm sorry, short-term bicycle parking areas in the lobby there. And uh, we have circulation to the east and to the north connecting to MAG-1. Um, the unit mix is um, a lot of two, 10 three bedrooms, which should be 20% is gonna be large three bedroom units. Those will be three bedrooms with two uh, bathrooms. And 46%, uh, so the majority of our other living units are two bedroom units with one bathroom. 
Um, you might note uh, on this slide to your left that there is a large 20-foot setback from the uh, zone, the residential zone, to the east of it. Our requirement is a 10-foot setback, but we will be providing a 20-foot setback. Another big uh, component of this design is while Magnolia 1 is a five-story building, Magnolia 2 will be a four-story building, so significantly lower in scale. Um, which we think is kind of fitting as it meets the uh, end of the neighborhood there along Fargo. For materials, um, our plan is to do a very simple pallet of clay brick masonry, uh, just like Magnolia One, except uh, we were probably limited to two types of brick that ties in both in texture and in tone uh, to Mag One. Uh, we are still starting to develop uh, the uh, materials composition but the idea is to pick up on the, the tone, the windows, the high quality construction. We'll have vinyl windows with a bronze finish. And like I said, a more simple version of um, Mag 1. Um, so I think that um, that pretty much covers uh, where we're at right now on the plan. And then, like I said, more specific program elements will be followed up soon. Thank you. Hello. Um, again, my name is Dulce Weston, and I work with Bremen Construction, who's going to be the general contractor for this project. And I'm going to skip ahead two slides. So this is going to be a negotiated contract in order to kind of make sure that we're meeting all our goals, including our pricing goals. Uh, and part of our role as a general contractor is to make sure that we're also meeting all our diversity and equity goals with this project. So Bremick is committed to having a person of color as part of the on-site supervision. And we're working closely with uh, Tony with MCIP, as well as Nate and NAMAC to make sure that we're reaching all those minority subcontractors, all those smaller subcontractors, Section 3 subcontractors, and make sure that the word of this project gets to them and encourage them to bid, even if the project might be a little bit of a larger scale that they're usually comfortable with. We are committed to achieving the 30% goal on this project. And whenever we have this type of project, I always look to um, Basically, our ideal project is Portland Mercado. Uh, that project had a 20% goal, but we were able to reach 42% by the time the project was completed. But more than that, we were able to really engage the community in that project. We were able to have meetings kind of like this to meet with the people who lived around the area and really get an idea of what the community needed out of that space. And we were able to meet with the vendors that now occupy that space to make sure that everything they needed was part of this project. And I really hope that this uh, Magnolia 2 kind of has the same feel, especially with the maker space and the community space, that we're able to reach the community and make sure that um, those goals are met and that the space is going to be exactly what the community needs in that, in that place. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Jones. I'm the executive director of Metropolitan Contractor Improvement Partnership. We are a uh, nonprofit organization founded by NAMAC Oregon in 2008 to build the capacity uh, focused on minority and disadvantaged contractors. Uh, and so what we do, we focus on uh, values of reduction of barriers for those businesses. We focus on increasing their capacity through education, and we focus on return on investment for our clients and our partners. And how we do that is um, we provide a couple uh, services to uh, identify to build capacity and also identify new contractors in the industry and build new relationships. So we have a plan center where businesses can find out uh, opportunities, not only about uh, this job, but other opportunities in the market on a daily basis, um, where we send them information about jobs daily. We also do monthly workshops, capacity building workshops on different aspects of business from estimating and bidding. Uh, project management, uh, financial management, and now uh, training them on online tools. We just had a workshop in partnership with PCC 
uh, last week uh, in partnership with NAMAC Oregon, and we're training uh, contractors on Bluebeam, which is uh, now an online takeoff and a uh, document control uh, software. Uh, everything's being done more online with your phone, and we want our contractors to be up to speed with what's going on in the, in the industry. We also do an annual subcontractor trade show. We put the small businesses in the booth, so actually they get to spend time with owners and general contractors, making connections, building relationships in the industry, and also in partnership with NAMAC. Uh, uh, NAMAC does their uh, bi-monthly industry meetings, which is another avenue and opportunity for uh, minority disadvantaged contractors to learn about opportunities in the market and build relationships. All these uh, avenues, uh, in addition to building capacity, uh, also provides opportunity to learn about new businesses that are in the community that are, that are growing, want to have an opportunity to do work on these projects. So I was happy to hear Dulce say that uh, there will be opportunities for smaller businesses, newer businesses that we meet, uh, so we can break down packages, uh, so we can get those fir firms in the opportunity. Um, but it all comes down to results. We've actually had good partnerships with uh, Innovative Housing in the past, starting with the Erickson Fritz. We worked with them in Silco Construction and they achieved 42% uh, uh, minority women in emerging business participation, but equally as important for us, uh, we have a strong focus on minority um, uh, businesses and we had good representation of those businesses on on the project, a number of our clients that we work with participated on that project. Uh, as well as 14th and Raleigh, that was very exciting because what you'll hear from us typically is that in the trades of mechanical, electrical, and plumbing are areas that typically, A, we don't have capacity, or B, uh, we have to work so fast to get the design done, and we, we, we didn't have the time to get those businesses included. So I really want to applaud Innovative Housing for uh, taking the initiative, reaching out and working with us collectively uh, with NAMAC Oregon. Um, they achieved 72% of the work actually went to minority and women-owned uh, contractors that are actually doing the mechanical electrical uh, design and construction uh, on that project. And we're also working with them right now on this project doing the same thing in terms of soliciting and working with uh, minority businesses on the mechanical electrical plumbing trades, which are lucrative and high wage trades. So we're looking for that opportunity. So the real thing here I would close with is um, it comes down to leadership. It's about building relationships and providing opportunity and then support to those businesses so we can have the win-win and, and successes and investment in the community that we're seeking. Uh, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with all of you. Thanks. Good evening, Chair, uh, Oversight Committee. My name is Nate McCoy, Executive Director of the Oregon Chapter of the National Association of Minority Contractors. Uh, some of you know who we are and the work that we do in this community. Uh, but just real quick, we're an advocacy and membership group of over 50 minority-specific contractors. Uh, work in conjunction with MCIP that works a little broader. Um, but our, our whole theme is to build bridges and cross barriers. And why this project is so important to not only the community, but to the folks that we work with, is there's been an intentional engagement to hire minority contractors as well as hire minority workforce. And I can't say that uh, enough that IHI is already committed to that, and we'll be working with Brimick and Constructing Hope to reinforce that. Just ge geographically to let you know, because the site is just down MLK, and the three organizations that you'll hear from, including us two tonight and Constructing Hope, are within a mile proximity of the site. So when you talk about having a community benefit, it gets no better than having the advocates and those that support uh, the community and the contractors to be working on this project in conjunction. Um, NAMAC's gonna be asked to do something that I think has not historically been its hallmark. Uh, we typically work specifically with the contractors in helping develop, uh, develop their skills as well as their back offices. But NAMAC's going to take a little bit of an approach to actually work more effectively on the workforce. I don't have to stress the fact to all of you in this room that we have a huge disparity in our community around all things society-related, society around health, jobs, housing, all of those things. 
And I always say that if you give a person a living wage job that they can afford, um, they can live anywhere in this city and not ask for anything. Um, so the challenge that we've been tasked with is to extend our, uh, our olive branch to the community and to work with Constructing Hope that is a pre-apprenticeship program. Um, and the key thing is early and often. Um, as a former construction manager for the city of Portland, I can tell you working with contractors with a lot of these policies that we have on the books, what always gets left behind and is always the afterthought at the end is what do we do with the minority workforce? We have pre-bid meetings, pre-outreach meetings, contractors, a lot of contractors uh, that look like uh, uh, me and some of our other minority communities don't always, uh, aren't always ready for the game of uh, understanding workforce training and hiring, maybe not needing additional support, or maybe not knowing where the resources are to find additional support for their, um, for their crews on site. So one of the things that we've been tasked is to go talk to Constructing Hope hold pre-outreach uh, meetings before the project even starts with key subcontractors to introduce them to people they may not know in the community. And even more than that, one of the things that we also want to do is to talk to those in affordable housing that IHI already serves as well as others in the community to see who might be open or looking for a resource or an opportunity to get into the workforce. And that's not being done today, I can promise you, because I work a lot on a lot of projects. and that's not the kind of role that normally happens. So we're taking a very intentional role of not only coming in at the beginning when we kind of get people into the workforce, but making sure as mentors, as people who know um, a lot of folks in the community, being a resource so that as people get on to job sites, as people need soft skills training or any of those things that we can kind of capture them early and keep them in the game. A lot of people get into the workforce industry and a lot of people drop out of the workforce industry. The challenge here is to make sure we keep them in, graduate them from pre-apprenticeship up to apprentice programs, and hopefully capturing some of our companies that work on the project that will keep them retained uh, for a lot longer than this project. Um, and then the last thing I'll say that I think is also one really cool aspect that uh, IHI and I think Brimick has also committed to is the cost for getting folks into the apprenticeship programs is huge. It's of the magnitude of eight to ten thousand dollars per uh, can, per resident or per per uh, uh, trainee uh, in the program, and so the uh, the owner as well as Brimick have agreed to at least scholarship a couple of individuals in the community so that that's not a burden or a barrier for them if they're interested in getting in. And then also thinking about how do we work with other industry to help them get boots, equipment, whatever the necessities are to be functional and ready to perform and you know build their skill sets. So um, again, uh, this couldn't be more of an, a valuable uh, project as well as just something that I think will give back to the community, including, and I think maybe Constructing Hope will talk about it a little more, is a space that uh, will be afforded to them that will extend past this program or this project that will be used by community, that will be used by a lot of folks uh, for hopefully a long term. So with that said, I don't know if there's any questions before we step off, but would love to answer anything. We're at almost 18 minutes. We've got about 12 left. Anyone from the Oversight Committee have a question for these guys at this moment? Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Pat Daniels, and I'm going to thank Tony for a great introduction. I'm the executive director of Constructing Hope, a pre-apprenticeship training program in the neighborhood, and we are really excited to be a partner in this project. Um, I'm here to tell you about what is in the makerspace, and of course we have an outside and indoor play area, but the makerspace itself is designed um, to um, introduce the community to trades. As Tony talked about, my, our minority community and low-income community has not been introduced in entering the trades at the numbers that we'd like to see. Constructing Hope has partnered with this project so that in most spaces, there's a community room, but this community room is going to be a trade center. It's going to be like your high school shop area, where the residents that are living in the building will have an opportunity to enjoy the space. When you think about living in an apartment building, and these apartments are going to have patios, um, what is it like to have a wire light um, workshop right here in your building? So if you've never been introduced to trades, and your kids, and we're talking young kids, anyone in the residence, 
can have an opportunity to come down and do a free workshop. We're going to provide all the tools, everything that they need, including the safety training. So constructing HOPE's partnership in this is first we're helping design the workshop and you can see how we've put some, um, the workshop and design the wall space and the safety precautions and everything that they're gonna have in the building. But um, again, we were thinking about um, what is it like and to see the excitement on young kids' face if um, rather than go to the store and buy a, a lawn chair, what about if you come into the shop and today we're gonna make lawn chairs for your own area and for your apartment? So those are the kind of things that we're looking at in just teaching people in the space that they live in. The other thing is in the trades right now, everybody's looking for that younger workforce. Well, Constructing Hope not only provides an adult program, we have a youth program. In our youth program, we're talking about kids ages 15 to 19, but if you live in this, pro in this uh, complex, you'll be right where the youth program is gonna be held. So for five weeks, we partner with Northwest College of Construction as well as other agencies to introduce youth from ages 15 to 19 to construction. Right now in our facility, Constructing Hope um, targets people coming from incarceration. So about 60% of the folks in our program are formerly incarcerated. So therefore, we cannot have youth mixing with this adult program. But this space will be some place that we can also hold our youth program so that the youth that actually live in that complex, as well as any other complex, will have the opportunity to come and be introduced to construction in a safe environment, as well as receive a stipend for that introduction. Once they go through the youth program, they also have the opportunity to enter our adult program, which is just a direct entry. And as Tony and Nate alluded to, we have direct entry with all of the trades with Northwest College of Construction. So here's an opportunity for low-income people living in the entities that they're living in to begin a career in the trades. They'll be introduced at any point that they want. They get hands-on training. So um, I'm gonna say that what we're here to do as a program is to help leverage the funds. Because um, this community, if we go for a community livability grant, the economic impact of the project is gonna be huge. We, um, Constructing Hope, have about 70% minorities in our program and that's our target population. So not only will we be able to pull residents from this apartment complex, but there are how many other complex? 10. There's 10 other apartment complex that would be, have the opportunity to join this. Plus the neighborhood. And the neighborhood to, to work in this community space. All right, back to IHI for a little bit. I should have started by introducing innovative housing moment just at the very front end of this. Um, I kind of short-circuited that. So innovative housing has been developing affordable housing in Portland for over 30 years. We have about 1,000 affordable units in the Portland metro region. And um, as you've seen, you know, the way we do that, we develop, but we don't do it ourselves. We're the owner. You know, we put the financing together with a lot of funding partners. We bring in a team, um, which you've seen tonight, and really getting, getting the projects done and meeting the goals we set for ourselves, it has to happen through partnership and relationship. Um, so we're very proud of some of the relationships we've built and the outcomes that they have, that they have resulted in. Um, shifting to, I'm happy to answer questions about IHI too, but I'm gonna try to move us along quickly. Um, our commitment to equity is a real one. We try very hard to make real connections, use relationships, and acknowledge that you know, racism and discrimination in housing have had very damaging effects on communities of color. So as a housing organization, it's really incumbent upon us to take proactive steps to try to provide equal access to communities um, that have been harmed by that ugly history. And I think you all know better than anybody you know, that Portland is kind of a, Portland and Oregon have their own particular problems. Um, so we apply our equity commitment across all of our lines of work. We're talking here a lot about construction and during the project, but we're talking about access to housing, delivery of our resident services, our operations at our properties, and also the way we run our organization. I'm gonna to get to housing access and our lease up strategies in just a moment. Um, looking at our construction goals, the city has a 20% requirement. We always aim higher than that. We usually shoot for 30. We usually exceed that. Um, we also understand that MWESB doesn't accomplish its goals if it's all ESB. 
So for example, at MAG-1, our 35% utilization rate broke down to 22% MBE, 7% ESB, and 6% women-owned businesses. And that doesn't even include the second-tier subs or the work of our minority-owned co-general contractor that we had on the project. When it comes to site staff, our experience has shown us that it's very important that site staff reflect the communities that we're serving. So we work very closely with our property management companies to make sure that we hire managers of color throughout our portfolio. Um, it's my personal belief, and I think this has been borne out, that having a manager from the community of color has made a huge impact on lease-up demographics, who moves into the building. Um, during lease-up at MAG-1, both our manager and our, and our maintenance staff were people of color. And we've had turnover over the years, but we have maintained that commitment to having uh, African-American manager on site and we will maintain that commitment at MEG-2 also. We're going to consolidate operations, so we see these two buildings really functioning as one large community, and we're going to continue to do there what we do now. Resident services. I um, have a brochure in case anybody wants to learn more about resident services. I could talk about that for at least an hour. I'm going to sh shortcut that as well. Ex okay, exactly. So um, we offer resident services at all of our properties. Thank you. They're basically wraparound services designed to support our residents and just make sure that they, our primary goal is maintaining housing stability and accessing opportunities. Our services look a little bit different in every property because we tailor them to the individual property. We try to be very resident driven and responsive, but we do have a core program um, that we offer everywhere. It includes new tenant orientations, education and workshops, resource referrals, community building um, events, and significantly eviction prevention intervention whenever non-payment of rent or behavior starts to jeopardize housing stability. At our family sites, and MEG2 will be a family site, I don't know if we emphasized quite enough that there are a lot of two and three bedroom units going into this project, so we're, we are programming for families. Um, we include after school activities and homework help, and we have an education initiative that's focused on connecting with the schools that our residents go to and really facilitating and encouraging parent engagement at school and in their kids' academic life. Um, we put a lot of energy into helping kids get to grade level at their reading skills. Um, high school graduation is a major goal for us, and we also help with post-secondary planning. Uh, we work in our family sites with parents and kids together because we think it works best to work with whole families and, and so we, like for example, design workshops that are, that are targeting both teens and their parents. We have a sex education workshop that made me nervous at first, but it has rolled out and been a huge success where we do it slightly differently but we deliver the same information to parents and teenagers in both English and Spanish. Um, moving to the next slide, this is stats and history, on our first uh, Magnolia One, we decided that we wanted to use it as an anti-displacement um, site rather than exacerbating what was happening in Northeast Portland. So, you know, before the preference policy existed, we decided to do lease up a little differently. We kept it very local. We did not post on Craigslist. We advertised by word of mouth, flyers in local businesses, flyers at local community centers, and a sign on the building because our goal was People who go by this building every day will know that it's available and will get local connections and people who know the neighborhood and who um, have a, a connection to the neighborhood. And that worked. Our outcomes, were, we were very pleased with our outcomes. Um, I'm happy to report that we have maintained those demographics. In August, 54% of our residents at Magnolia One were African American. And perhaps just as importantly, um, our residents are maintaining their housing stability. Over half of our residents right now are original residents. So they moved in when we opened, they're still there. And that, to me, means we're doing something right. Conclusion, I mean, I'm, I'm to the conclusion, there's just a couple additional items that you might want to know about the project. We've committed to 12% of our total units, or six of them will be affordable at 30% and below. Um, we plan to work with the city and county's Joint Office of Homeless Services to provide additional support and serv wraparound services to um, homeless families. And we are planning to tailor our screening criteria to make sure that that does not become an unnecessary obstacle to access. So, thank you. Very much. Thank you. And questions, comments, we would love to hear. We're here to listen, even though we don't have very much time. Questions from the Oversight Committee? I, I just had a quick question as we're late. If you turn her mic on. Oh. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me, newbie. Um, 
I had a quick question as it relates to the numbers that Mr. McCoy and Mr. Jones were talking about. Um, as it relates to uh, this particular contract you have with Bremix Construction, uh, have you been working with them on previous projects? Or is this your first time? So this is actually NAMAC's first time working with them, but I know of Brimick and their track record. Um, and Tony just recently got off a project with them. And you know, for all candid purposes, uh, Brimick has not been as, uh, as affiliated with NAMAC over the years, but certainly on this project, we're trying to build that relationship and help encourage the part participation that we want to see. Um, and the hopes is, is that they would be a part of the NAMAC family going forward. Okay, so Tony, as it relates to this particular project and the project that you were on, as you know, one of the things that the Northeast Economic Development Alliance pushed way, way back yonder was the idea that one way to grow businesses is to, if they are able to work, improve themselves on the job, uh, the previous job, that there was opportunity for them to also be hired on the next job. So is there that potential for this, with uh, this project? Yeah, I mean, I, that's my general approach when I talk to general contractors. I mean, um, there's a balance there. Uh, one, yes, you do absolutely want to, if you found a business that you're working with, they're small, you know, you're, and smaller or mid-size or, or, or larger, and you, and you establish that new relationship, and they've worked for you, why wouldn't you uh, use them again? Uh, I think there's a, that's a good way, uh, I think what I would say to a general contractor is, yeah, go after where you know you have relationships in the minority contracting community and bring them on the project. Okay. Second. Okay. So related to that, as it relates to the apprenticeship, Oh. As you're bringing on apprenticeships oh, that were apprenticeship. on the previous project. No, you were right on with the piece oh. about the contractors. But I'm also curious about the end where it's about the jobs. How mm -hmm. about being able to continue those folks who were hired on on the previous job on this next job? Because they can't get the hours in if they, mm -hmm. if they don't have the job. Right. So just speaking from Bremick, uh, we do a lot of shifting people around between our jobs because we don't just have this one job going on at a time. Right. We have lots of jobs. And if we find someone who's good at a particular skill, they will go on to the next project to keep doing that. We do not get rid of people at the end of jobs. We just shift them around to the next thing that they're doing. So when it comes to apprentices, uh, I recently heard from our vice president that we're the biggest female apprentice uh, contractor in the Portland area. So we are constantly looking for more and more people uh, to fill our spots and our, both our president and our vice president are very eager to, and they are very connected with the union and we keep track of all our apprentices and we're always seeking to hire that new generation of carpenters or laborers or whatever it is that get brought to our job. So I definitely don't I, I agree with you. All of the people who get hired for this project are not going to get hired just for this project. They're going to be hired for Bremick, and they're going to continue working for Bremick for as long as we have work to do. Okay. And then my last question is for LRS, I think. Uh, I love the work you guys do. Uh, but I'm curious where in this project is the sustainability or of what are the aspects that I mean, are you having to do anything around uh, infrastructure for future EVs? Is that a are you were you able to bypass that piece of requirement? So we are the project will have Earth Advantage Gold certification. So our main focus on Earth Advantage is for pieces that relate to economic savings for the residents and for the building and also um, protection of resources. So for instance, all of the plumbing fixtures are water saving and all of the light fixtures are LED. LED. And we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be PVC panel ready. Uh, so 
we're not we don't have that in the budget right quite yet but if we have uh, room and when we have room we'll be ready for it because we'll have the infrastructure there. okay and the last question is you said you're you're four stories instead of five on this building um, and you have inside space even though the parks close by I, I realize that but is there was there any consideration of some portion of that that roof being open space for families or for growing things or anything like that? That's a really good point and I'm glad you mentioned it because Magnolia One has a roof deck. So the building that connects to this has a roof deck and, and we have planters and, uh, and so the buildings will connect on every floor. Okay. So the residents will not only have the benefit of the maker space and the indoor outdoor play areas, but they'll also have the benefits of Magnolia One, which are actually two roof decks. So our roof is, is going to be full of hopefully solar panels and, and, uh, and mechanical equipment. But, um, and we are, we're, we're trying to get a good bang for the buck. So the roof deck on Magnolia One, it was an expensive item. And so we're, we're trying to make this building efficient and, and deliver a lot for the dollar. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next is the ADU program, which I will allow you to explain to everyone who's here who may not know what an ADU is. Um, Ira Bailey and Andrea Matheson. Good evening, I'm Andrea Matheson with the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, to kick this off, an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. Um, it's a secondary unit that is uh, either developed um, as in built new or added within existing living space to uh, a primary structure. Um, the Portland Housing Bureau has been working to develop a concept proposal to share with you this evening in response to feedback that the Housing Bureau has heard over the past couple of years as we've engaged the community um, in a series of community forums to program both the original $20 million allocation of TIF in North and Northeast and also the TIF lift resources. Uh, in addition to the Housing Bureau's work, the Prosper Portland North Northeast Community Development Initiative uh, has also asked for a, a concept proposal to be drafted around using accessory dwelling units as a home retention strategy for low-income, long-time community homeowners uh, to help them retain their home. So I wanted to provide that as background context uh, for why we're bringing this concept for you to review tonight. And with that, I will turn it over to Ira Bailey to share the program in more detail. So our Accessory Dwelling Unit, or ADU Loan Program, is really our home ownership retention strategy um, that's intended and designed to assist low-income, long-time homeowners, so to help uh, lower the displacement that has occurred in the Interstate Corridor area. And we want to do this by creating a fully permitted accessory dwelling unit within the basement space. And we believe that this ADU or accessory dwelling unit will be able to support the homeowners by either allowing them to increase their revenue through rents that would be whatever they can charge or the market would support. They can use it to provide or receive support from family by allowing that space to be used for a family member, such as a parent or a child. For those households or families that may need medical support, they can use the accessory dwelling unit as a living space for the care provider. So you can have a live-in care provider or a close proximity care, uh, care provider. 
And in exchange, or the benefit of that, is that by offering a discounted rent, you may be able to receive the medical services you need for a discounted price as well. There's also the potential for homeowners who wish to downsize and don't need as much space as their primary residence to keep that house in the family or, or in their own ownership. They themselves can move into the accessory dwelling unit and then rent out the larger space for potentially a larger revenue in the market. Now I do say that, that rent can be whatever the market would support because we are not going to be regulating the rent. So these will not be considered affordable rental units. However, we will regulate that the units cannot be used as short-term rentals. So although they don't increase the stock in Portland of affordable rental units, does not mean that they cannot be rented at an affordable price. Uh, they will add to the stock of permanent affordable or permanent rental units within Portland. So just some general terms of the loan. We are going to be offering a loan to create these ADUs. It is a max loan of $80,000. It is a 0% interest loan, so we will not be charging interest, and it will be repaid over 15 years in equal installments, which, if maxed out, would estimate to be about $450. The loans can be assumed by family members. So in an unfortunate event where a homeowner cannot reside or remain in the home due to medical reasons or if unfortunately they pass away, if that home is transferred to a family owner, they can remain on the terms of that loan throughout the remainder of that loan. Um, the loan itself will be secured against the title of the home. So this would equate to a second mortgage. Just some general loan qualifications. The homeowner will have to be current on their current mortgage if, this, if there is one. The property taxes have to be current or the homeowner has to be in a tax deferral program. The home has to have enough equity to secure the loan amount. So we don't, do not want to exceed the value of the home by providing this loan to homeowners. So the available equity has to be there to secure the loan. We also want to make sure that the homeowner can afford the payments since it is a repayable loan. And uh, I will address it a little bit more in detail later, but because the ADU would, it, would essentially increase the value of the home, there is going to be an increase in property taxes. And so we are establishing a 60% debt to income ratio, which essentially means that the payment in their current debts can exceed 60% of their income, which is a lot more lenient than many banks would do because banks have to be a little bit more stringent in that. And the homeowner cannot have a reverse mortgage for two reasons. One, by design, a reverse mortgage eats up the equity in the home. And two, reverse mortgage lenders tend not to allow second loans after that, after the reverse mortgage. Um, in order to qualify for the program, it is two parts. The homeowner themselves have to qualify as well as the property. So in order to be an eligible applicant, you have to be a homeowner. You have to be a long-term homeowner, which we define as someone who's lived in their home prior to, prior to the establishment of the urban renewal area, which is August of 2000. However, we've also heard from the community the, those who have maintained home ownership in their family. So a homeowner who has purchased a home that was in their family prior to that establishment can also qualify for this program. And we have an income limit up to 120% AMI, which will adjust by household size. The property itself is a home that's going to be, at least for the pilot program, a home that's located in the interstate corridor urban renewal area. It is going to be a single family detached home, so no duplexes or townhouses or triplexes. And it has to have a basement of a, at least 500 square feet. The primary unit, we want to be in a safe and habitable condition. And in the event that that may not be the case, the program is also designed to provide an additional or up to $15,000 in a home repair loan that actually does not have to be repaid back. So that portion would not uh, have a minimum payment going forward. And that home repair can be used to bring the house itself up to standard. If the homeowner is under, I believe, 80% for land. 
is under 80% AMI, and they have a child who is under six years old, or has a child who is under six years old that visits for at least 60, uh, 60 hours a year, they may also qualify for some additional funds for lead remediation or lead abatement. And then some general program requirements. So because this is creating rental space, it, it allows homeowners or will cause some of the homeowners to become landlords. The landlord tenant law in Oregon can be very tricky. Fair housing laws in Oregon and the city of Portland can be very tricky. And so in order to help support the homeowner and provide that homeownership um, success, we will be providing landlord education and that will come through one of three sources. Either the Bureau will, will provide that directly. The homeowner can attend the City of Portland's landlord training program, which is offered by the Bureau of Development Services. Or if they choose to use an affordable model, which is uh, supported by Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon's Metro Home Share Program, which is a home seeker, home provider, um, matching and support program, they also will provide landlord education to cover those items, such as landlord tenant law and fair housing. The homeowner also will have to register as a business in the city of Portland. So um, as far as in to address the taxes issue, we did confirm with the county of of Multnomah that the property taxes will increase. That increase will be based on the value or the assessed value of the accessory dwelling unit. Unfortunately, they cannot give us specifics at this time because we won't know that until we have the particular houses. But after speaking with several individuals who build and construct ADUs themselves, what we've been told is that the average assessed value of the accessory dwelling unit is about fifty to one hundred thousand dollars. The increase in taxes has averaged between five hundred and fourteen hundred dollars a year. Um, we've done some estimates our, ourselves and have shown that monthly that increase could be $160 per month on average. That also speaks to why we also want to allow for market rate rents, um, because with the home payment as well as the increase in taxes, um, we want to allow homeowners to be able to collect enough additional revenue to support themselves to be able to stay in the home. Um, as far as outreach, how are we going to find these homes? We're going to do two mass mailings. So one in initially is going to be to all the homes in the interstate corridor area. And that's because we don't know every home that may qualify. But we have identified at least or around 450 homes that would specifically qualify for this program. And we're going to have a secondary mailing directly to them. Um, to invite them to participate in this program. We've also reached out to our community partners such as PHC, PCRI, African American Alliance for Home Ownership, Urban League, SEI. Uh, we have spoken with Metro uh, or Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, uh, NEA, and others just so that they can reach out to their clients and the families that they themselves support. So at that that is the end of my presentation any questions thank you very much committee commence so i my question is about the um like the specificity around the adu itself mm -hmm. um why is this limited to basement unit conversion only as opposed to for example garage conversion so in talking with designers and uh, contractors who've built accessory dwelling units, what we found is that the basement is going to be the least expensive option, at least on average, it's, it's better to do that. And so we're able to assist with more families. It also reduces our requirement to pretty much regulate the rent at that point. Um, detached, the reason is detached accessory dwelling units can cost around 120 plus thousand dollars. Um, and at that point, there would potentially need to be more restriction on how that is handled because we would want to be more responsible with that trusted, with those trusted funds. Make sense? But you have a limit on, I mean, there's a dollar amount on the funds, right? Correct. So not, 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 not just not following your last point there. Okay, go ahead. 
So we worked with the PSU, Institute for Sustainable Solutions, um, and the Accessory Dwelling Unit Work Group that they have been regularly convening for a couple of years to really dig into average costs for different types of accessory dwelling units. Um, as Ira was saying, what they reported to us is that anything other than a basement can have significantly increased average costs. So the $80,000 limit is a, a PHB proposed, a self-imposed limit. So right. if, you know, if folks were to tell us, you know, we would rather have detached ADUs, freestanding garage conversions for 120 or more thousand dollars with a regulated rent, that would be something else that we would consider. I think, you know, we're just bringing this for discussion purposes. But that is, that's a couple separate things though that you just said. One thing is about the amount of subsidy that you're providing and the other thing is about the regulation of rent. So it doesn't strike me that it's necessary if you said 80,000 is the amount of subsidy that we're providing. If someone says, well, I wanna do my garage, and it costs more than eighty thousand. You're still only giving them eighty thousand dollars. So I'm not. I just. It, it seems like you're at it. You're. I'm asking yeah. a question about why this has to be only for basements, and does that not restrict in some ways the possibilities for this program? And is that necessary? Because it seems like you can create these parameters however you like, and so, still maintain that subsidy amount. So there, there. There is the consideration that, yes, we could say we're going to provide 80000 However, that homeowner who wants to do a basement or a garage conversion or a standalone who would require $120,000 or $140,000 for that same ADU would then need to take out additional funds. That would potentially yes. work against that homeowner in two ways. One, the, the additional funds, if borrowed, would work against them in their debt to income ratio. Our loan, our loan itself could potentially work against them in being qualified for those funds to pull that out. The second argument would be who sits in second position or first position if the mortgage is already paid off or third position that would have to be a conversation that we would have to develop. Um, and so for us, the basement is what helps us, or choosing the basement, in the, at least in this pilot, is what helps mm -hmm. us control how much subsidy we provide without creating an additional burden on the homeowner. If that, so. I guess I, I would be curious to know, um, I am aware that PSU had that working group, but I haven't reviewed in any detail their findings. Um, in what way making this decision, in the, even in the pilot program, constrains the eligibility um, in terms of numbers of properties or numbers of households who fit the income criteria and also have a basement mm -hmm. versus having other, either space on their property or a garage? Like, what are the actual outcomes or implications of this in terms of people's ability to take up this program? And as a pilot, would you want to test out the proposition that the scenario that you've described would occur versus another scenario in which it worked out financially and was more lucrative? Perhaps you can rent a standalone ADU for more money than you can rent a basement ADU, um, so, et cetera. So in, rental, in, in, in the case of rental amounts that you could collect, yes. A standalone would allow for more rent. The other part of that is that when it is a standalone, it also contributes to the potential of having homeowners insurance increase because it is a standalone. Um, for the equity loan, a home buyer would need to take out, the rules are a lot more stringent than a purchase loan. The credit needs to be higher, the debt to income ratio needs to be more restrictive, for example. So Ours allows for, again, up to 60%. Mortgage lenders are gonna stick a person around 40%. And, and what that essentially means is that the homeowner may not be able to qualify for enough loan with the going rate, the interest rate that the bank would charge to subsidize the difference. The asset limit that we, that we require that's set on the program is $20,000. So at best case scenario, it would be a detached accessory dwelling unit at 
at 100,000 max, if, if, that, if, you're, if, if that math makes sense to everyone, because there is a $20,000 asset limit. Um, however, that's, that still would potentially work against the expense that the homeowner has to incur on that home. What we don't want to happen is for our program to be the reason why a homeowner loses their home due to the affordability risk. So that, that is also our, our big concern. If, if it came to a situation where $80,000 could be used on a home and the basement would cost $90,000, but a conversion would be $60,000 for some reason, that might be that may be something that we could consider, but as as the base rule, it is basements because that's the for the safe assessment the least expensive, without putting additional funding burdens on the homeowner. Yeah, we've got about five. Uh, I just want to let you know I have I think it's a really innovative program. I have a ton of questions, but I converted my garage to an ADU, and it was way less than eighty thousand yeah. dollars. So okay. I think that um, I, I totally agree with what Dr. Bates is saying here. I think that this uh, this is an artificial limit with yeah. some assumptions. With you know, there's all there's. Um, people doing a lot of construction themselves there's and still having it be up to code there's a lot of ways that one could reduce the cost of converting a garage or um, I don't know a ton about detached I didn't build one so I, I just wanted to say that that it's not that's not making a lot of sense to make that restriction and what you just said that someone could come and then you might make that consideration but they're not going to apply if one of the criteria is a basement apartment I, I think I heard you say that you were concerned about the cost of insurance and and the additional uh, expenses that would be associated with a separate unit versus an, an interior unit. Uh, maybe that needs some more consideration based on what we're hearing here. But I was curious about why it didn't include the, there are a number of houses that have large attic spaces that wouldn't take a lot to convert the attic space to for livable space maybe has a basement that has water problems and, and would be much more expensive to do. And so, um, again, more flexibility for the homeowner. That's one thing. The next thing is in, in Phoenix, they had they built this whole big thing about spring training and all these new gadgetries for folks to go and watch it. But on their way there, right outside the stadiums, were all these homes that were not nice to look at. So they did something like we do for storefronts, they did it for home fronts. And they provided the, the you talked about 15,000, some of these homes, and I'm thinking about black families that have ha had homes for a long time and need upkeep and a lot of them need roofs and a new paint job and plumbing issues and and basement issues uh, and they probably are not on deferred um, and some of them even are having problems making their 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 home loan so those are the people that I'm wanting to see actually be able to retain their homes and see a future with some of these opportunities that you're talking about, how do we ensure that they're going to be able to do that if we say you can only use your basement and sometimes 15K is not gonna be enough to get that house presentable enough for you from what I'm reading here to see it as a likely project. Thanks. Um, Sheila, I appreciate that comment, uh, duly noted. Um, I think we definitely need to be taking that into consideration. Um, I think I, I do want to acknowledge the perception that PHB has kind of voluntarily constrained the pool of eligible properties that we would include. I think that that accurate perception is, on a, I think from our point of view, um, something that we are proposing because within this pilot, we simply wanted to learn some lessons with a single type of ADU. 
So um, basements, starting with basements, for example, getting that process nailed down, streamlined, learning the lessons that will be, I think, challenging and gnarly that we know we'll be learning, and then moving on to either attics or garage conversions or even detached ADUs. So, I think you know we don't have a ton of extra staff resources for capacity uh, for this, and also just wanting to make sure that we've got one type of ADU done correctly before we expanded the program. There's, I think, potentially there will be a lot of interest in the community, and being able to um, kind of narrow that eligibility naturally by kind of limiting the type of property that would be eligible was one thing that we're proposing. But I'm definitely hearing the feedback from you all. Uh, just quickly, a comment, not really a question. I, I do want to see additional development because we're creating opportunities for people to become landlords, and that has its own set of encumbrances that they have to navigate, and they might not have had the opportunity to participate in such. And then additional clarity as far as the assessed value and the market value of someone's home price, and being very, very clear about uh, the amount that they're going to have to repay and the added tax um, as, a, as in association with how much uh, the ADU has increased in, in their tax, taxable value. So I think that the very clear um, uh, conversation with individuals or at least information about how much this is going to increase because that's in association with them becoming a landlord and then having to pay back this money in a process that they've never um, participated in possibly before, and I know we've had a conversation about that, so I know that that's something that we're all looking at. Um, even though this is a pilot program, I think those wraparound services as uh, beginning as a landlord would be a great support. Dr. Bates, very quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think just to, to follow on to that, there is a lot of complication in the, in the sort of financial capabilities for folks to understand even the difference between how you know your mortgage lender appraises your value and your the county is going to understand the value increase and in setting rents and thinking about how this all works out monetarily, um, which just brings me to not specifically only to this program but in general one of my favorite things which I haven't mentioned in this committee for a while which is estate planning and this very desperate need for folks in this community to be engaged with around estate planning. Um, you know, you, you brought up, Ira, the, 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 the inevitability that we all um, move on at some point, um, and that is such a moment for either intergenerational wealth transfer or, or, or total loss. Um, and, you know, it's something we've, we've talked about in PHB's budget before, um, not a TIF expenditure, but how to bring to bear some other kinds of funds, community resources, around ensuring that people who are, certainly people who are participating in these programs are getting the kind of education and support they need on these legal processes as well as the financial processes. So as you can tell, there's much consideration and uh, perspective and ideas as it relates to um, this particular program. Again, why having the information in advance helps us. Um, so I would ask that um, you take the suggestions and then evaluate the best kind of practice or how to uh, incorporate this information into your next steps or what it is, um, uh, how you see going forward. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You Appreciate it. I, I just want to say uh, I really appreciate the fact that you guys have produced a tool. I think it needs to be fine-tuned and have a little bit more flexibility. And the outreach Absolutely. needs to be a little bit broader. But I'm glad you got it. And we have Absolutely. something we can start Yeah, with. we support the idea and the strategy of, of helping to mitigate displacement. Um, but there's also an opportunity, I think, for the Oversight Committee to uh, submit a request from Dr. Bates' statement in regard to the budget. Uh, as the city is putting together its budget that we request funds for, estate planning to assist in that process. I think there's an opportunity for that. All right, uh, Andrea Mathias, and you're gonna to talk to us about the recommendation. Yes, so uh, two months ago at the last oversight committee meeting, PHB staff brought forth a request from homeownership community partners 
for an increase in subsidy from $80,000 to $100,000 per unit for two types of homeownership activities. The first was uh, or would be a buyer-initiated down payment transaction. So it would be a homeowner who is buying a home listed on the private market, kind of that arm's length transaction, if you will. Um, they're going shopping, they're finding a home that someone's listed, and they're purchasing it, receiving down payment assistance from the Bureau. The second would be a PHB financed uh, home ownership development project. And what that means is that the Bureau underwrites the financial documents and information associated with the project so that we have very clear, transparent, and verified financial information about the costs associated with the land acquisition, the construction costs, the soft costs, the mortgage amounts, and the households buying those units. So two different types of homeownership activities that we are proposing this subsidy increase for. I believe Leslie Goodlow sent out with the agenda uh, a copy of the memo from the African American Alliance of Homeownership Collaborative um, who brought forth this request. And so next to me is Steve Messinetti, Habitat for Humanity, to answer questions and talk a little bit more about the content, talk a little bit more briefly about the content of that memo. Um, but I also believe that uh, you have in front of you a short little matrix that talks about uh, the impact, the increase in buyer-initiated down payment assistance would have um, going from eighty dollars to $100,000 for a household at 80% AMI in terms of buying power and the available inventory um, that's available in the market currently that would be affordable to them. And so I just wanted to make sure everyone had that piece of paper and then also available to answer any questions about that portion additionally. So with that, um, I think one last takeaway, the memo that the AH Collaborative submitted provides more content and detail, but I think at this point the Housing Bureau um, development, financial development staff have evaluated three different home ownership projects and their financial information, and the takeaway for us at a very high level at this point is that if subsidies are 80,000 per unit, we can build home ownership units for households between 60 and 80% MFI. It's a stretch, but we can do it. Um, but if uh, the subsidy is, wait, let me make sure I got that right, $100,000 is necessary for households between 60 and 80% AMI in terms of development. If the subsidy stays the same, the status quo, $80,000, we're really limited to households with incomes between 60 and 80% AMI. So that is the conclusion that we have come to. Could I ask a real quick clarifying question? Absolutely. Before we get into the details of this. So um, Andrea, you, you talked about two kinds of homeownership projects. The buyer initiated, I understand that. The second one, PHP Finance Homeownership Project, does that also have down payment assistance as well for the buyers. It's both financing the construction and also there's a down payment. That's correct. Gen it, can be, it can happen a variety of ways, but generally speaking, the way we would do it with these resources for the three projects that we looked at is that the, um, the projects would have permanent subsidy that stay in them in the form of what equates to a down payment assistance loan. The permanent subsidy lowers the sales price or the mortgage amount for the buyer. Same amount for households Correct. It's the okay, so right. It's the same amount of funds per household. Not, it's not plus. Right. No. It's the <laughs> equivalent. Yeah. Okay. So then can I just ask, what is it that we are doing right now? Are we this oversight committee, are we being asked to like decide a thing, comment on a thing, just know about it? So we brought this issue at the last meeting 
uh, and were asked to provide a little bit more information and clarity about why the need to increase the subsidy was necessary. So I think we are looking for the Oversight Committee's support in making the increase. And so I would say that um, two things. So since we did ask for more information around um, data so that we could be more informed, I think my ask to the Oversight Committee is based on the information that you've seen and or ability to peruse it, how comfortable are you at this moment to make recommendations or uh, is there time or what it, where, where are you um, as the Oversight Committee in relationship to the information you have? And or any questions you have? I don't feel I've had enough time to review the information. Um, to really, I have several questions, but I, in order to make a decision today, I don't feel like I saw, I, I haven't been able to really break it down. So that, that's my opinion. I don't know if everybody else is ready to go to a vote, but I feel like I, I just need a little more time with it. Apologies. Um, <clears throat> No, I agree. Uh, I think that even just from the question that Dr. Bates, you know, in the com comment that she had, uh, all in all, I think just a little bit more time to, to review everything and really come up with an, an educated, uh, have an educated uh, comment or, or, or thought about what's going on. Um, I think, so what I'm challenged by is that there, we have this memo that's in this packet, but we also have had coming around some other um, documents that are in some ways aligned with in other ways a little bit different, a little bit distinct from this, the Odd Collaborative, the PCRI group also has some other things that they've brought up. And I'm, I'm a little bit challenged to like synthesize an understanding of the big picture of what is going on and what is likely to be going on and what we hope to be going on. Um, and it would be helpful. I don't know if it's, I don't know how to get to that point. I don't know if that's about PHB trying to give us a summary of where the sticking points are. Um, I will say that in the sort of subcommittee conversations about this, uh, the preference policy and this home ownership programs and then the materials that we've gotten here I, and these are not, these are not like pointed questions I think anyone has an answer to at this moment. I see people who are trying very hard to do well and do good. I see PHB crafting program. I see nonprofits applying to the program. And then we seem to be in the space in which everyone is saying, wow, this is totally not working for a variety of reasons, whether we like, we apply to this, but it actually doesn't work for us, or we apply for this and our model doesn't fit with this model, or maybe even we all knew that this wasn't really going to work in the parameters of the program, but we kind of took a swing at it anyway. And so that is, that's, it's very hard for me to understand why we are stuck in this place and why it's begun to feel like a, a stickiness. Um, you know, I, I wasn't at the last larger oversight committee meeting, but this has been this whole series of meetings talking about this 80 and 100 and 80 and 100, but there feels like there is a bigger problem here um, and whether that's fundamental to the specific models that are being attempted. Certainly we know the market is, is the problem, but how can we get out of this how do we get out of this space? Um, what, because nobody is satisfied with where we're at in terms of outcome, outcomes for people right now, right? Like no one is feeling like, great, this is all working out. Um, what, what, what is going on? Go ahead, Steve. I'm uh, not going to attempt to answer all of that, but um, I do think what we're asking for here, or what we're, what, why we're presenting this is really a response to the families that have come to us through the preference policy that got the highest scores that are majority lower income. 
And instead of just saying, no, you're not qualified, we can't serve you, we're saying, hey, the Oversight Committee has said, let's serve those that have been the most impacted, that are in the greatest need, that are at the highest points, and that we don't get down the list and have less of an impact on our intended goals here. And to do that, more subsidies needed. I think that's the, the, the just, just of it for us. I get that. But it also so, feels like we're, constantly, we're having the same conversation. Everyone's like, we already knew that this was going to be the problem, and yet we all forged ahead in some different kinds of ways, or we knew that we didn't care for certain components of this program, but we're forging it. It's, it just mm -hmm. it, it feels a little confusing and at times antagonistic as to why we cannot problem solve around this. Um, so if I could interject, I mean, we're at 8 o'clock at the moment, and I hate to cut things short. Um, my thought is that we have a specific meeting with the Oversight Committee to talk specifically around uh, home ownership and that that is all we do. And we, could, we could host that meeting or hold that meeting even next month. We want to expedite. We don't want to wait till the next Oversight Committee, but we could have a meeting that specifically is around so addressing moved. these issues. We agree? Because I don't think anyone on the Oversight Committee is ready to make any assessment at this moment. No, I have a lot of questions. So, so if, yeah, so if we'll, we don't have time for them today. Then we'll I postpone it. Let's, if like is the oversight the committee in agreement that we would have a special meeting specifically to deal with home ownership? Yes. Yes. All in favor? Beautiful. All right. So we'll postpone. We will set a date for October, and we will have a special meeting that just addresses this. Thank you, Bishop. Holt. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We have one more item, and uh, I didn't mention at the beginning, and I apologize. We have made an adjustment to our time frame to go until 8.30 as opposed to trying to be done by 8. And as you can see, there's so much to address and so much to deal with that our time frames uh, are still packed with um, agenda items. So uh, next up, we're going to hear from Reach in regard to the Argyle site. Great, thank you very much for the time. Dan Valliere, CEO at REACH, and... Lucy Corbett, Housing Development Project Manager. And so we just wanted to come tonight, we'll make this very brief. Um, there are slides, but I think really we can just give you the critical update. There is one significant change that we want you to be aware of, and it's gonna lead us into some fundraising over the, starting this month. So we wanted you to be aware of it and to get any feedback from you tonight about the change. The significant change is that, as, as a reminder, when we were here before, this project was a mixed project of 150 affordable apartments and 65 market rate apartments. This was a project, this is a project that TriMet and PHB partnered on originally, mm -hmm. right? TriMet land, PHB invested some resources for the affordable housing. Um, and REACH got involved when we put in, in an RFP process, right? and we're selected as part of that. So we have been going down the path. Um, we're still very excited about the project, um, but we had a problem with the market rate housing. So for that to work, um, we had made certain assumptions about the rents. We had made um, certain assumptions about equity and investment that we would need to secure from other parties to help us make, to finance the market rate piece. Mm -hmm. um, I'll let Lucy ask, answer any more questions about it, but the fundamental is the rents we ended up uh, projecting were too high, and the equity investors we talked to were not interested um, and saw it as too risky to do market rate right now um, at that location. Hmm. REACH wasn't going to take risk all of our uh, limited reserves on market rate housing either, so we made the proposal to TriMet to change our strategy and instead of the market rate units to develop additional affordable housing apartments um, and to have those also be, you know, just like the original 150 um, part of the North Northeast preference policy. Um, but that's a big change. So we recognize that. Uh, TriMet, we had a lot of discussion with them. They um, ultimately have agreed that that is a strategy they can support. They're most concerned about the density at that site and how many units um, but we're going to satisfy that. And um, PHB also has supported 
that change, although PHB has been clear to us that at this point there's, there's no money identified, no additional money identified um, in the URA or elsewhere to support the additional units, right? Um, and we have a gap of funding because of this change. So there's a slide that summarizes that in a nutshell. Our remaining gap right now is about 3.8 million. We are, um, REACH is raising, we're doing our own fundraising for that, and so that's some of the fundraising we're doing privately. Um, we're also planning to apply to the State of Oregon LIFT program for some additional funding, which we think has a good shot. And um, we're also in discussion with TriMet about TriMet investing additional resource in the project. So that's the fundraising that's going on with this new plan. We wanted you to know about that, and you want to just review the unit mix? I mean, we don't have an exact, but sure. yeah. So like Dan said, when we originally proposed, we had 150 units of affordable housing and 65 market rate units. As we developed our program, um, we have added more family size units. Um, so we now have a total of 198 units and 100% affordable. We also have about 8,000 square feet of commercial space in the project. Um, I can go through. They're all, all affordable. The majority of them will be at 60% AMI. We have 10 units at 30% AMI. If uh, Home Forward reopens their voucher availability, we will be seeking additional 30% units. Uh, right now, the project can only support about 10. And that will be without any vouchers, so that's just 10 financed through the project. 10 at 30 percent. So again, yeah, we have a few other slides, but I think, you know, this is a reminder of the site plan, community outreach. We can go through any of this, but time is short. I think the key is this big change, and we want you to know that. Give us any feedback or questions, because we're going to be doing fundraising the next couple of months. We will keep coming back to you also. We'll come back next month. Um, quick question. Could you break down the... Um, mm. Okay. Um, the various sources of funding, what, how much is debt, how much is equity, how much is LIHTC? Can you, can you just briefly, I don't need a, you know. I can go yeah, through the general sources. I don't have all the numbers in front of me. Okay. Um, but we would be um, going in for 4% tax credits and um, state issued bonds. We have the 10 million um, issued by PHB and we will also be seeking some additional um, state gap financing sources. So they have some weatherization money and some other gap sources. Um, and then the big gap filler for that $4 million uh, or almost $4 million gap would be, we are um, currently planning to apply for 3 million in Lyft and then raise an additional 800,000. So the um, state issued bonds is the debt on the project? That's correct. Thanks. Is that enough detail? Or because we could send we could send more, but would you like more more detail? Yeah, I'm, I'm, that'd be great because I'm where I don't I, I we don't need to go over on that, the, the um, nitty gritty right about now. The bonds. So we have to use at least fifty percent of project costs in bonds with the tax credits. That's part of the way that pro program works. Um, we would likely be seeking a permanent lender who would be buying uh, the majority of those bonds, um, and that would be then our permanent takeout loan. Well, I commend you on creatively uh, addressing this transition. One of the realities of what we're doing is we're um, in what we'll call ebb and flow. Things are changing, and in order to do that, you must be creative. So I appreciate that. And the fact that you are, it looks like that uh, you're committed to cover that $3.8 million through your own strategic uh, fundraising efforts, right? Along with uh, the, we don't have the lift funds yet secured, but we believe that we are um, 
have a high chance of being awarded those funds based on what we understand the criteria to be at this point. However, the state has not yet released the uh, application for those funds yet. So this strategy does rely on um, an award of lift funds. Okay. So again, we'll come back next month and we can take you through where we are on that and maybe some other contingency ideas we've been talking about. But um, I think for tonight, the main thing was that this is a big shift and um, yeah, we can come back and talk more in detail about funding strategies next month. Well, I appreciate it. Any other questions from the oversight? Well, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate it. For those who have remained, we appreciate your attendance and your time tonight. No one signed up for public testimony. We have a few more minutes. Um, Mr. Posey, I see your hand going up. Let me remind everyone that uh, as it relates to public testimony, that it's in, in regard to what's on the agenda tonight. If there are other items of concern and um, uh, interest, then the way we address that is by either grabbing staff to identify what that is or emailing, calling to make sure that we can address them. But we, we do in the oversight committee is to address what's on the agenda, the items that have been discussed tonight. So, Mr. Posey, sir, you've got three Thank minutes. You. Three Good minutes. Wow, man, it take me three minutes just to say my name. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, I just wanted to make mention of the fact that, uh, broadly speaking, um, listening to Professor Bates of the, what I considered a very tepid approach to how we're addressing this problem. I was uh, in the other uh, meeting the other day when Derek Hydra spoke, and he talked about going beyond housing. And it occurred to me that in that same meeting, you all talked about a, uh, a bond $258 million or so for 1,300 units. And I, I'm, I was having a hard time uh, finding the connection between why would you do a bond that's only going to address that portion of uh, units, uh, whether it was, uh, I don't know what the rationale was, but it seems to me uh, we're not bold enough to ask for enough money to really solve the problem. And that, it really concerns me about that. Let me just say this little piece here. Uh, I was listening to um, uh, Reverend here talk about uh, Emmanuel Hospital. Uh, you know, this community has picked winners and losers. Emmanuel Hospital was a winner. And when the Reverend talked about holding uh, uh, Emmanuel Hospital accountable, there are other players in this process that need to be held accountable also. And that includes many of the business who have gained uh, you know, benefit as a result of what's happened to the African American community. And uh, it's, it, it just concerns me that, I, as I mentioned to Kimberly, I'm not hearing enough about private public partnerships in terms of getting money from them. I'm talking about Northwest Natural Gas. I'm talking about all the other utilities, all the other business propositions that have gained as a result of this. And maybe somewhere in your strategic plan, you guys will be talking about holding these businesses accountable. But it would, it would make me feel good if you all really looked at Reverend and what he said and really put a number on it on what it would take to make this community whole and work toward that end. Because just dealing with housing, as Derek Hydra said, is not going to make this problem go away. And so to the extent that you all can talk about that in that expansive sense, I would sure like to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just say to you, in terms of the bond itself, there is a bond oversight committee. And so I would encourage you to interact with them specifically, and I can give you more information on that offline. Well, thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. I appreciate your time, your effort, your energy. Oh, was there someone from the Oversight Committee? Lisa? Yeah. Well, I really appreciate what Mr. Posey just said, because something that, you know, I have been thinking about, you know, both since Dr. Hira's talk, but just generally in the program that we're trying to work here, was back to before this Oversight Committee happened, when, when folks were getting into rooms, uh, to talk about the initial $20 million additional investment in, this, in the URA that came on the heels of this 
very strong and very important critique um, by Paul of public investment-led displacement. And the, the boldness in those rooms was, you know, people talking about $20 million into $200 million. And certainly, you know, all of these housing developments are leveraging additional money. Everyone is, everyone's getting more, more money, whether it's from the state or from LIHTC or from other projects. But that kind of larger articulation that this needs to be bigger, this needs to be more than just dollars equates to units, but a real community development program, I do think that that's been lost. Um, and I don't know how to constitute that um, in terms, it's not quite this oversight committee. It's not really the, the uh, NETI committee. It's, it's something that's a bit bigger than that. Um, we are being talked about, I mean, part of the reason that you have a, a national scholar like Derek Hyrett coming and speaking at PHB, you have media attention, is that this effort is being talked about nationally. I can tell you in the circles of folks talking about gentrification and displacement, this is being talked about nationally as thinking about the preference policy, thinking about rerouting people in community, and then when you actually get down to sort of where the rubber meets the road, the resource base is not commensurate with the level of, I don't know, the, the need or the enthusiasm and the, and the urgency and the intensity of our feeling for it. Um, and so I am really interested, you know, you see it in the home ownership program, we're seeing it again and again, like how do we make this as big as it needs to be? And, and who can, help us to do that. And I think, and I appreciate you raising that. I think that's part of, absolutely, it's worth clapping. Uh, um, I think that's part of the conversation that we have with our mayor who comes in November. Uh, in our private meetings, we certainly have talked about the fact that the, the monies that are presently existing, we know, do not encompass the need, nor the impact, nor even the economic loss that has transpired. We're very much aware of that. And then to your point, uh, Mr. Po Posey, we fully understand that it's not just units. It's not just brown people in units. It's everything pertaining and supporting all that goes with that. So I think that's part of the discussion we have. And to support Dr. Bethel's statement, uh, it requires of us some strategic intention to leverage the authority, weight, voice that we collectively have to put pressure on the entities that have benefited from um, all of the displacement and gentrification that's transpired. So we've got a lot of work to do, and it is beyond the scope of this specific oversight committee, but we can participate in that process. Yes, ma'am. What you just said speaks to what I see as what part of the major problem is, is that we keep reiterating and coming up with an, adding a new piece but not having the complete puzzle. And some of the answers to me seem real simple and we complicate it and add more bells and whistles that address a broader issue but never really get to the issue of of the fact that we have folks in the community who are losing their homes, who have certain circumstances that we need to address if they're going to be able, the ones that are still here and struggling to do so, to be able to keep their homes. And uh, that's why I said earlier, I applaud the effort that was made around the um, ADU, but there's pieces like you were mentioning that we've been talking about all along that um, required discretionary funds that are not there to address the education that those folks are in those homes need in order to be able to truly keep them and take them to the next generation of families. So I, I think that um, the idea of the bond and being able to leverage it up to more dollars if we still leverage it up and still think in the same ways or new ways that don't really address the real issue or get the results we're after, then we're still in the same boat we were. So. Go ahead, Kip. 
Um, can I add to that? I, I mean, I, I do appreciate that comment. I think that's very well pointed. Um, I want to mention something that uh, Dr. Holt actually mentioned during this conversation, you know, about identifying budget asks but it's generated from this group. That was a, a very well taken point because identifying that there's that need, he's also helping us navigate the process for getting that money, especially for groups of individuals who haven't been a part of that process. Um, there was something that uh, Tory mentioned from Prosper Portland. He said, we have a community navigator to help individuals who have never navigated these processes to navigate the process. So I think that that's what we reiterate because we know we have individuals who need this wraparound assistance and there's models that already do it. You've got permanent supportive housing. It's a wraparound service. But for individuals who have not benefited from some of these systems, we are starting to generate the ideas, and we do have people can, who can help us help the community navigate them. I think it's important for this group to identify that and then act on it on behalf of the community, because if they knew how to do it immediately, I think that they would. And I think that that's the role and the responsibility of this group of hearing the community, using all of the the, the long um, you, you know the long term existence that you've had in these communities, and then connecting it for them. So, um, you know, as Dr. Holt mentioned, we're uh, uh, about to begin our budget process for the 18-19 fiscal year budget. And so if it's okay with uh, members of the Oversight Committee, I'd like to be in touch with each of you over the next couple of weeks and set up some meetings uh, to talk about what a North-Northeast budget package request to the Mayor's office would look like. And then maybe I can uh, take a little bit of time on the special October meeting to put the whole package together and, and see if that's what this group is looking to submit uh, as a part of the Bureau's budget process. And I will say, uh, uh, Sheila, that what you mentioned is exactly what I believe we're engaged in. That's what this process is exactly about, to be very specific, very direct, and to have real impact. Success for me related to this work is that families, that lives, that individuals have secured affordable long-term housing, that people are getting economic opportunities to grow, and that we have wealth creation that's generational. That's success for me. That's what success means for this oversight committee. And our responsibility and our commitment is to the broader community and not individual interests. And so, uh, which is why we are, um, nonpartisan. So we're holding everybody accountable. We have the expectations of the city to perform. We have the expectation of partners to perform. We have expectations that there will be opportunities for the distressed, the uh, disadvantaged minority, emerging small business owners to have great opportunity to grow their capacity. I think that's our voice. I think that's our charge. That's in our charter. And that's what we're committed to do. And that at the end of the day, if all we've done is bring in affordable housing, that's okay, but that's not the complete uh, desire of the individuals, I believe, that are sitting here at this, at this table. So it isn't that we're ethereal, conceptual, and we've got good ideas. We want product. So that's what we're committed to. So thanks, everyone, for being here tonight. I appreciate your time. Thanks for hanging out to the end. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, the staff members of Portland Housing Bureau are around. So if you have questions or thoughts or concerns, you can grab them and get uh, their business cards. And then several of us will uh, still be around to answer questions. Thank you very much. Have a good night.